Hello and welcome to a little mini series that I'm going to be doing where I'm going to be going over mine and a few other people's top five games of 2017. The rules are quite simple. The games do not have to have come out this year as long as they've been primarily played this year and enjoyed. So we're going to start with me today and then following on from this episode I'm going to be interviewing a couple of guests. So let's get straight into it. Going in at number five, I've chosen Infamous Second Son. Now, although this game didn't actually come out this year, it's one that I've definitely enjoyed and I've been wanting to play for quite some time, but I finally got around to it this year. In this game, you've got smoke, neon, video, and also concrete. And sort of three of those four are absolutely incredible fun. Uh, smoke is the first one you get, and it's got a lot of options available to it. And they really, really, really did a good job of making each power feel different. Although they sort of had this very similar mechanics, they brought something unique to every single one. So for example, Neon, you could run up walls, smoke, you could go through vents, etc. Concrete, I was a bit disappointed with. Uh, you don't get it until right at the end of the game, and you can only really use it in the post-game, where there's not a whole lot to do. And it was just unfinished. It didn't feel very polished. It didn't have a final smash, as it were. And so that's sort of really the only nitpick I have with the game. I really, really liked the characters in this game. Uh, you've got Fetch uh, and Eugene, which both have really, really interesting backstories. And um, with the inclusion of the DLC, uh, First Light, you get to explore like Fetch's sort of side of things, which you don't find out a whole lot about in the game. And I think they really did a good job, not just with Fetch, but with all the characters, including, you know, your brother and Eugene and Betsy, who's like your sort of carer as it were and sort of the cast was what really really made it even the villain did a really great job because you get to see their side of things every time you take someone's power you get to see their origin story which is something i really liked and it was a great touch and it's something i think they should do more in future games um i suppose sort of the f my favorite thing about the game would be just this massive open world that you've got where you're free to choose your own path. You've got the whole karma system which I think worked really nicely and depending on whether you choose to do the light or the dark missions you get different powers available to you um, which is really cool. The side missions were actually really fun as well so obviously being an open world game you can follow the main story at your own pace while also undertaking side missions and although sort of a lot of them were quite similar sort of take the compound, capture the flag, destroy the thing. There was a lot of stealth missions involved and a lot of track the signal missions where you had to sort of use your powers and use your skills to sort of a use that you wouldn't normally have to do in the main game, which really brought out a new side of things. And I really enjoyed that. And overall, the game just sort of looked gorgeous. It had a really nice story, really good cast of characters. And it was just incredibly fun. It was just a really, really fun experience, just messing around in the open world, which is something I really, really like in games. And that's why it's at number five. So moving on to number four. Now, at number four, I have placed Nier Automata. Now, although I haven't finished the game, I'm definitely really enjoying it. And although it's not quite open world, it is sort of wide arena. So even though you have like a sort of linear path that you've got to follow, you are free to sort of go to the side and you're quite rewarded for that because there'll be hidden chests or hidden little secrets or other bonuses that the game sort of rewards you for straying from the past just a little bit, which I really, really like. Now, the characters, uh, you play as sort of an android named 2B or depending on which level you get in the game, you get to play as other characters such as 9S. And initially you think sort of, oh, I'm playing as an android, how fun can that be? But actually, once you get to know them, they have really, really cool personalities. I suppose the strongest point in this game is the combat. And although it's a little bit hack and slash at times, they do a really, really good job of making it unique because you can customise it incredibly. You can make it to suit your play style, whether it be you favour attack, you favour defence or mixed. You've got different weapons available to you, different combos, different ranges. It's, sort of, it's up to you, really, how you want to take on this game. And there's no set combo or set armor that means this is how you win. Every combination brings unique advantages and disadvantages, which is really nice. And it sort of, if for me, it made the game feel more personal and more suited to my playstyle, which I really, really liked. 
the graphics is something we should mention now the game is just gorgeous they did a really really good job with the engine uh, making both the character models and the buildings and basically everything in this sort of massive massive world look absolutely beautiful they've got a really nice art style going on if the art style is good that's a win in my books now like i said even though i haven't finished the game i can already tell it's got a lot of replayability especially because um once you finish one story you get the opportunity to play it as a different character and i'm really looking forward to that because it'll bring a new experience and a new angle to the game that you haven't seen before and what I'm also really enjoying is that when you take on sort of some of the side quests available, you really, really get to see some of the lore that's hidden in this game. Because although the sort of the main story does give you the gist of things, it's not the whole game. There is so much more story to be found, especially if you take on sort of certain side quests that I know about. And I'm really looking forward to finding out what this game has to offer besides the main story. And overall the game is just really enjoyable. The combat's nice, you've got a really really nice transition from sort of 2D platform fighting to aerial combat to 3D hack and slash and they've done a really great job. Obviously Square Enix had an input in this game and sort of in other games their combat's been... it's left a bit to be desired but I think whatever input they had in this game it's gone in the right direction and they've done a really great job. And then just sort of overall, the characters are really fun to get to know. The story is really, really interesting and it instantly hooks you and you want to find out as much as possible. And all of those add up to make a sign that this is a great game and one that I'm really going to enjoy. But because I haven't finished, that's why it's still at number four. Moving on to number three. And at number three is a game that is my first instalment into a franchise and it was both a very eye-opening experience and a very fun experience but also a learning experience and that game is Final Fantasy XV so like I said Final Fantasy XV has been my first Final Fantasy game and it marketed itself as a game for first-timers and fans alike and I can definitely see uh, the way that they did that and they did a really good job with that and I have to say that I really, really did enjoy the game. But at the same time, even though I haven't played sort of in many other Final Fantasy games, I did notice a few issues which I think other games would have done better. So Final Fantasy XV was the first game to introduce sort of live action combat, which is something I really, really enjoy. And I'm so tired of sort of turn-based combat games which is why I've never been able to get into the sort of Final Fantasy franchise because although they tend to shake it up a bit every few games majority of the games are turn-based and I really couldn't get into that but Final Fantasy 15 really appealed to me because it introduced live action combat gorgeous 3D open world and a variety of other features so like I just said Final Fantasy XV is an open world game, for the most part anyway. You've got this absolutely stunning and gorgeous open world that you're free to roam around in either on foot or with the regalia which is the car in the game and I'll get onto that in a minute. Or probably the most fun part of the game is exploring the world with chocobos, like the little ostrich type horse things that you get to ride on. I think they're absolutely adorable and they're probably my favourite part of Final Fantasy. The game is absolutely gorgeous and I was instantly hooked. If I could live in this game I probably would because it looks that good and I'm really really impressed with the team and what they were able to pull together. They've made every area sort of feel really 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 real so although it's this fantasy world it's grounded in reality and you've got like diners and gas stations and hotels which you think hey that could exist in real life but they've got this really rustic yet unique style which adds this element of fantasy and wonder to every area of the game and just makes it a joy to explore. So as I was saying the majority of the game is open world but it faces a few problems so it's a really really quite a big world but 
at the same time, there's not a great deal in it. You get from A to B by driving around in the Regalia, which was a mistake in my opinion. Um, they wanted to do something a bit different, so they introduced driving, but they did it in a really, really poor way, so that the majority of it is complete autopilot, or at least semi-autopilot, which makes it very boring. They did try and fix this in some DLC by introducing the monster truck and the sort of jet plane regalia, but in my opinion, both of those were a big letdown. So that's one of my problems with the game. My other problem with the game is that like I said, the open world isn't that interesting. There's not a lot in it. There's a few enemies and stuff that you can fight and obviously side quests take you here and there, but there's not really any secrets. Unlike sort of near where there's little rewards or little chests or little hidden gems for you to find if you sort of stray from the path, there's no lore, there's no, you know, hidden bosses really. Anything that you do find sort of outside of the main story isn't very beneficial and then once you get into the second half of the game that's it it, it does give you a warning that you, you you'll be more restricted but it doesn't actually tell you hey that's it no more open world you want to explore tough luck which is really disappointing because in my opinion the second half of the game is even more gorgeous than the first you've got places like Niflheim and the train routes and all of them were just begging for me to go and look around them but you can't they're just sealed off and that's incredibly frustrating, especially since it looked like, when you look at the map for the game, it looked like there are other areas that they were thinking of letting you go, but maybe due to budget or time constraints, they just decided against it, which was a big disappointment that you couldn't explore any of the second half of the game, which just, especially when you get to the sort of the final boss and you go back to your hometown, you go back to Insomnia. I was looking forward to looking around Insomnia the entire game, and it kept hinting that we were going to go back there, but by the time we do, it was incredibly disappointing. It was very, very linear. You barely get to see anything. However, the combat was very enjoyable. That is one positive of the game. The combat was really fun. Live action is definitely a step in the right direction. But at the same time, I think it could have been better optimised because the camera angles were horrible. The camera was all over the place and half the time I was being attacked and I couldn't tell where I was being attacked from purely because the camera wasn't focused on my character. And you've got this whole sort of block then counter mechanic, which again was poorly optimised and half the time I kept pressing, mashing or holding square, but it just wouldn't block the attacks. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at in the future games. Keep live action combat, but make it better optimised. Now, we can't talk about this game without talking about the cast. And I have to say, Final Fantasy XV had a really interesting cast. And I think there was a character in there for everyone. I personally didn't like all the characters, but I think they did a really good job in the writing of those characters and in the design. So obviously you play as Noctis and you travel around with Prompto, Gladio and Ignis. And I think there's a character in there, like I just said, that you can definitely identify with. My personal favourite was Prompto, just because in my opinion he had one of the biggest character arcs. And then later on in the DLC, you get to explore that even further. You get a D They added in a DLC for each character, which was a really, really nice touch, but at the same time I think it's something that should have been in the game to begin with, because Gladio disappears for several missions and you have no idea what he gets up to. And then they're like, hey, you want to find out what he gets up to? Buy the DLC. So, when I enjoyed the DLC, I do think it's something that should have been in the game to begin with. And I really enjoyed the sections of the game where you get to sort of split into teams and play as those other characters. Because while sort of warping around with Noctis is incredibly fun, taking on different combat styles is also quite fun. So sort of Gladios is quite hack and slash but also he's a tank, so he can take a few hits, whereas Noctis would kind of struggle with that. And then obviously you've got the team up attacks. So once you build up a certain amount of charge, you can team up with particular party members to perform special attacks, which I thought was a really, really cool touch, especially when you get people like um, Aranea coming in. And I have to say that the boss fight was Aranea was probably one of the most fun parts of the game. And obviously you've got other characters like Sid and his daughter and Gladio's sister. And they really just help to give this game more depth and sort of more story besides the main quest. And it just 
makes for a really, really nice experience getting to know these people. So when we talk about the story, in my opinion, it's a bit of a mess. Now, the one problem with this game is that you kind of had to read up about it and watch the cinematics before going into playing it in order to understand half of what was going on. And then, even then, it was still a mess. You end up fighting a giant water snake boss out of absolutely nowhere. And that was very, very befuddling. As the story gets towards the end, it gets more and more ramped up and more and more exciting. You've got car chases, you've got train fights. And actually, that was one of my favourite parts of the game. And I just wish that there was more like that to begin with, or at least more evenly spread throughout the game. But overall, I found Final Fantasy XV a hugely enjoyable game. And although it had its disappointments, which is probably why it's only at number three, it still had a lot of fun elements. And if they can take what they did with Final Fantasy XV and improve on it for future titles, then I'll definitely be interested in continuing with the franchise. So coming in at number two is a game that's had a huge impact on me this year. And it's one that I didn't even know existed until quite recently. And that is Persona 5. Now, I wasn't even really aware that the Persona franchise existed until a friend introduced me. I played through the sort of first half an hour or so thinking, hmm, maybe this will be all right. I quite like the art style. But then after about 45 minutes, I was hooked. I just could not put the thing down. And I think my final playtime ended up being about 130 hours. I think the cast of Persona 5 is probably my favourite cast of sort of any game ever. And each and every single character felt really, really different and really, really, really well developed. They felt grounded and relatable. And I found that even with characters like Morgana, who were annoying as all hell, I could still understand their side of things and relate to them on a personal level, which is something no other game has been able to achieve. I even found that the side characters like the teacher or the doctor or, or Sojiro were also equally as interesting as the main cast. And I'm really, really glad that this game has such an incredible story that's not just present throughout the main sort of linear pathway, but as you go off and explore side characters, there's so much more story to discover there, which was a really, really good thing. One thing that Persona 5 did that was quite different to some of the other games on my list is it's actually turn-based battle, but it's probably the most fun I've had with turn-based battle in a long time. Purely because there's sort of just so many options. You've got, you know, your personas, which have various different elements and different attacks that they can use. You can use physical attacks, gun attacks, or even talk to the enemy and try and persuade them to give you something. And then each character has their own unique sort of advantages and disadvantages. For example, you know, Ryuji has really, really high attack, but An has really good magic. Futaba doesn't fight at all, but she gives you insane stat buffs. Everyone has something to offer. The way that they did the story in this game, I also absolutely loved because sort of half of it is done through flashbacks. And you're told at the beginning that one of your characters has sold you out and one of your friends has betrayed you. And you're sort of kind of trying to figure it out and you're thinking, who could it be? Who could it be? And then all this does a fantastic job to lead up to some of the big twists in this game that, especially for someone who has never played a Persona game before, I did not see coming. And I really, really got very engrossed in the story and the twists. There are times in the game where you're just sort of on the edge of your seat thinking, what's going to happen next? Are we going to get found out? And But at the same time, you're like, who are we going to fight next? Who's going to be the next bad guy? What's the next fantasy palace that we're going to invade? Who's the next teammate that's going to join us? And that was something that I found really, really impressive and something that not many games are able to do. When it comes to the palaces, each and every one of them felt different and really, really fun in their own respect. My favourite was probably Okumara's because you get to just fly through these space vents and explore this space station, taking down robots and solving puzzles. And there's like a time limit at the same time. But at the same time, some of the other palaces were really, really fun because they also had really cool, unique mechanics, be it dodging lasers in the museum or sneaking through air vents as mice or in a 
being in a casino, trying to get enough cash to get to the next level. Each palace had something really, really cool and really unique going for it. And this was paired with an equally impressive soundtrack. Persona 5 probably had my favourite soundtrack of any game ever. So, so as I mentioned, the game is incredibly long, but at the same time, it never really felt like it dragged or it was confusing, a bit like sort of Final Fantasy XV, where you get quite confused. But in this game, I didn't feel confused at any point, and if I was ever in doubt about anything, I could quickly just check sort of the run-up of the story so far to remind myself what was going on. And I constantly was hooked on the dialogue, reading every single line, because I was really interested in what everyone had to say because it just added so much to the story and so much to everyone's character. And then they take this one step further by giving you the ability to romance and date certain characters, which is a really, really nice touch. I think it could have been implemented a little bit better, especially as you get towards the sort of end game characters like Haru. You just don't get to spend as much time with them as you would have liked and you sort of miss out on certain events and they feel a little bit rushed. But at the same time, I think they did a really good job, bearing in mind the amount of time they had to work with. And if they did try and flesh out these even more, the game would have just been a bit too long, probably. Part of me thinks LGBT relationships should have been an option in this game, but at the same time, I do understand that it is a Japanese game in origin and that that topic is less dealt with over there. So I can sort of understand that. There are sort of two sides to the game, which I found both to be equally entertaining be it levelling up your social ranks or just talking to characters in the real world or the whole combat side of things where you're going into people's palaces or fantasy realms and taking down shadows and enemies there. Both of them felt really, really balanced and it felt like there was a good shared amount of time between both. And I'd happily play a game that was just one of those things. But Persona 5 did a fantastic job of combining them both into one game, which was absolutely fantastic. The art style in this game was absolutely gorgeous. It was sort of anime, but also gritty and really, really gory at the same time. It fitted really, really well with the sort of th themes and story of the game, which was done fantastically. The idea of justice and sort of fighting your inner demons and fighting real life demons. It really did a good job of making you hate the villains and many of the adults in this game that just felt like these horrible people. but. It also gave you the idea that you have the power to fight this injustice. I think there were one or two weaknesses in it. For example, sort of when Haru's dad suddenly dies, she seems to get over it very, very quickly, which surprised me a little bit. But I think we can forgive it, bearing in mind it did an amazing job with everything else. And overall, this game was just so enjoyable because it looked gorgeous, had a gorgeous soundtrack, the combat was incredibly fun, I loved each and every one of the characters and it just gave me so much feels and sort of the ending and the twist just had me absolutely gobsmacked and I was just like, wow, this game has a lot of replayability, but I don't think personally I'll be replaying it anytime soon just because of how long it was. But that's not a nitpick at all, that's not a negative, that's definitely a really strong point of the game because it was able to fit so much story and so much development into this game that it really needed to be this long and it did a great job with it. But at the same time, it's only my number two. Before I move on to my number one though, I do have one honourable mention and that is Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. It was a mobile game for sort of Animal Crossing, which I was a bit sceptical about at first, but I have to say it did a really good job for what it was. It was a scaled down version of Animal Crossing, but it still maintained the charm. It still maintained the fun mechanics, and it's just really great if you have five or ten minutes to kill. So, what is my number one game of 2017? Well, it's actually a game that, again, was my first instalment into the franchise, I've never played any other games in the franchise, but I have to say it was incredibly enjoyable. And that is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now, like I said, this game was my first ever Zelda game, and I have to say it did a really, really impressive job. I was a little bit skeptical of some bits at first, especially when it was sort of on the Wii U or even the Switch, and the graphics weren't quite 1080. I was a little bit sceptical of that because Nintendo are known for sort of being a little bit of a letdown when it comes to things like that. And I was also concerned that the story would be a bit too linear or a little bit uninteresting. However, I was completely wrong. 
The graphics are absolutely gorgeous. I love the art style that they did with this game. It's got an absolutely immensely huge open world, which is always a big tick in my book. And there's so much content in it, unlike Final Fantasy, that it made the game so much more enjoyable. I find myself comparing this game a little bit to Final Fantasy because there were some similar elements. This game features live action combat once again, but it does it in a really, really cool, unique way. And there's so much more that you can do that you couldn't do in other games. For example, in Breath of the Wild, you've got the ability of stasis or magnesis, where you can freeze enemies in time or use magnetics to throw metal objects at enemies or use fire arrows or ice arrows or long swords or broad swords or shields or bombs. All of these are options are available to you and give you really, really unique, cool ways of taking down enemies or even solving puzzles or opening up the open world even further. The AI in this game was really, really smart. And I was really impressed with the enemy's ability to sort of learn from your tactics as you progress through the game. Although there's no leveling system, the enemies do gradually get harder and harder, either because they have better weapons, because they're bigger, or because the AI gets smarter. Guardians were a big part of this game, these sort of big metal robotic things that look absolutely terrifying. And when you first see them, you can do nothing. But then there's nothing as memorable as taking out your first Guardian. It's such an achievement. And what was really nice about this game is it doesn't require you to get a specific item or get to a specific level in order to take it down, unlike sort of previous Zelda games. You can explore this open world and go to whatever area you please in whatever order you desire. If you wanted, which is something I tried, you can go and fight the final boss immediately. You'll probably die, but the option is available to you. And I really wish that more games would do something as open and as free as that. Uh, in my case, when it came to sort of the divine beasts and the bosses, which you can take down in any order you want, and I have to say that each one of them felt really, really different, but difficult in their own way. Um, they each felt challenging and not just like a pushover. Um, but at the same time, it didn't necessarily require you to get a specific item or a specific weapon, like I mentioned earlier, to take them down. Because there's so many options available to you, like stasis or magnesis, you can find different ways of taking down the enemies and taking down the bosses. And no two boss fights will feel the same. Even between, you know, friends, I was talking to my friends about how they took down certain bosses and the way they did it was different to the way I did it because there's just so many options available to you. And like I said earlier, you can go to any area in this game at any time you like, and they're all hugely different. You've got like a volcano town full of these lovely rock people, but at the same time, to get there, you need like a fire potion or some kind of armor. Or you've got Gerudo town full of, uh, full of women. And in order to get into this town, you need to dress up and disguise yourself as a woman. Or you can go to an ice town, but you'll probably freeze. So you can go to whatever area you want. But if you try and get there unprepared, the game will punish you for it. You can do it, but you'll be punished for it, which I quite liked actually. So it shows you that there are these possibilities and that with enough determination, you can overcome anything and go anywhere you want. For example, I took down a guardian tower and a lightning tower when I was highly unprepared. I died countless times, but I managed to do it in the end because I had that freedom and I had that ability to sort of manipulate game mechanics to, you know, jump or bypass enemies completely. I think the way they did this game as well, in terms of story, even though you play as a sort of silent protagonist, they still made it really interesting because of sort of the, the, the other characters that you meet along the way. So you meet the wise old Impa, or you meet a crazy mad scientist who's trapped herself in the body of like an eight year old, which is hilarious. You even got Zelda in this game who had sort of more to do than some other games, even if she is just sort of like a, a spirit guide. The way they sort of explore characters through flashbacks was really well done, in my opinion. I think you get great development and it was great to see sort of the history of Hyrule and the history of the game explained in these different flashbacks. And I wouldn't mind playing through a prequel that that featured some of these scenes. I think that could be really fun. 
Also, this was the first game to introduce sort of customizable characters like Link. So you can choose whatever armor set you want. You can def you can have a, a pot lid as a shield and deflect a guardian's beam if you want to. You've got so many options. And that was a really, really nice touch. As you take on different shrines as opposed to dungeons in this game, which I think was a really nice way forward. They've sort of shaken up the gameplay mechanics a bit because after so many years of the same Zelda franchise, sort of certain mechanics do get to be a little bit sort of samey, a bit tedious perhaps. And I think that the choice to go with shrines and solve puzzles was a really good one. And sort of, although you don't level up, you collect these spirit orbs from the shrine and you can either choose to get more hearts to have more health when fighting enemies or more stamina to help you climb or run or fly or whatever. I also love the travel mechanics in this game. So you could fast travel between shrines and Sheikah Towers and such things. But at the same time, you could glide, which was a hugely fun thing to do. You could just climb to the highest mountain and then glide for as far as your stamina would let you. Or you could even get on a horse and just have so much freedom with that, which is something I once again compared to Final Fantasy with the chocobos, which were really, really good fun. But with the horses, they had very similar because you could go wherever you wanted. You could have your horse take you wherever you wanted, up a mountain, jump over bridges, etc, etc. Or you could just put the controller down and your horse would automatically follow the the pathways in the game. So you had an optional autopilot, which I think was a really, really good mechanic that Final Fantasy could learn from. There was also so many hidden secrets in this game. It sort of rewards you for going off the beaten track and exploring different areas because you'll find a hidden shrine or a hidden treasure chest or a hidden boss, which is really, really nice. And I kind of stumbled across the Master Sword purely by accident, just sort of exploring this forest, which was probably, probably one of my least favorite areas in the game, just because the whole mist mechanic was incredibly frustrating and the Korok trials were incredibly tedious but the fact that I just accidentally found the master sword earlier than I was perhaps supposed to was brilliant and you could literally walk into Hyrule Castle whenever you wanted and just steal some high level weapons and then run out again before you got attacked. I really liked that you were rewarded for pushing your limits and sneaking around and finding these secrets. That was a really nice touch. And also the way that you could sort of manipulate the game mechanics, like the ability to uh, cast lightning or the ability to soar high into the air was really, really useful, especially when it came to puzzle solving areas like mazes or whatever. I could just use the soar ability to fly to the top of the ceiling of the maze and just run across the ceiling until I found the entrance. Or when you were transported to the islands and stripped of all your weapons, I could still use the lightning to defeat the bosses <laughs> because I probably wasn't skilled enough to take them down by myself. The soundtrack for this game was also gorgeous. I think some fans were slightly disappointed when comparing it to other games, but I didn't have a problem with that. I thought each and every tune fitted the area, fitted the town, fitted the action on screen, and it was just really, really nice to listen to wherever you were. And overall, I just absolutely loved the freedom that you had with this game, the ability to take down the game and take down the bosses and take on the story in whatever order you pleased, with whatever weapons you choose, whatever method you like. It was incredibly refreshing and incredibly fun. And the story has really got me interested and invested in the Zelda franchise. Um, in terms of games I'm looking forward to next year, uh, I'd like to see a fully fledged Animal Crossing game come out on the Switch. I've really got my hopes set for that. Um, but I'm also really looking forward to Persona Q2 and some of the other Persona spin-offs. And that concludes my top five games of 2017. Later on, I'll be joined with a few guests and I'll be talking to them about their top five games. But for now, thanks for watching. <laughs>